it's a basic fact that we all know and appreciate. Namely, functions describe the world. Everything is described by functions. Now, right now, I'm talking to true believers, but not everyone knows that. Every, the sound of my voice, that's a function. The things you're studying, motivic uh, homotopy theory, functions. It's all functions. Now, I start certainly every course and frequently almost every class with that phrase. And I want to explain why I do that and why I am doing it here. Now, in 2017, I was also on the stage, and I started it with that. Um, and the reason why I did it in 2017 is going to be the same three reasons why I'm doing it today. Then it's going to start diverging from what was from 2017. The first reason why I say it is that I believe it's true. I mean, I don't know what all those words mean. If you really push me, any of them I'm not sure about, even probably at the level of the word the, but I believe it. And academia should be a search for truth. That's one reason. Second reason why I do it in classes. I do it a little bit because I realize it sounds over the top. It sounds a little, uh, I'm not going to say silly, but a little extreme. And usually, at the beginning of a semester, students laugh. But I don't think they're laughing at me. At least I interpret it they're not. Um, what it is, though, is it's setting up a couple of things in the classroom. First of all, it's certainly communicating that I think math is important. I mean, it's more than just practically important. It's talking about the world. It's why later in the semester, or almost immediately in the semester, I will talk about why do you do mathematics? You do mathematics because it's the ultimate description of reality. And it's what serious people do. And it's conveying that math is important. It also means it's probably practically important. So that's why I do it in classes. Why am I doing it here, where most of you believe this. Um, it's because I am really nervous right now. I usually don't get nervous in talks. I'm a, I'm a little nervous when I'm doing a research talk if someone's going to say, that's trivial. I'm worried about that kind of stuff, but I'm not kind of really close to shaking. Why am I close to shaking? It's because I'm talking about teaching. And that makes me uncomfortable. I absolutely did not go into mathematics to teach. As I described in 2017, I had a little history of how, oh, I didn't think about teaching at all. Oh, I think I'd hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Oh, my God, when they forced me to do it, I ended up loving it. And it is one of the great joys of my life, teaching. I love to teach. But I don't think of myself as a teacher. What gets me going in the morning is usually my research, which has nothing to do with motivic homotopy theory. I mean, this morning, I'm pretty sure when I woke up, I was thinking about, OK, OK, the natural extension in measure theory, yeah, it is a co-limit. But I, I can do it set theoretically. But how do I make sure the measures work right? Blah, 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 and I was brushing my teeth. That's the sort of thing that gets me going, not questions about teaching. And it's why in talking about teaching, it depends on what the conversation is, is whether or not I enjoy it. If it's about the craft of teaching, as some of us were doing at lunch today, how do you do placement? How do you do this? How do you, that I enjoy. Um, not for hours, but I, I, I understand it's an issue. I care about it. You know, how do you design the blackboard the right way? Craft element of teaching, I do enjoy. Grand theories of pedagogy leave me cold. And I don't, I, I don't know much about them. For all I know, there's tremendous research in theories of pedagogy that would revolutionize the way I teach. I just don't know. So in talking about teaching, 
a lecture about the craft of teaching would be overall kind of boring. Here's how I erase the board efficiently. That would not be interesting. But I do have to worry about those issues. In, at least in the US, there's almost a sense that you shouldn't lecture anymore. This has been a trend for many, many years. I can remember even 30 years ago, the phrase, no longer a sage on the stage, but a guide on the side. You were supposed to somehow not be the center of attention, and you should be trying to make the students interact. It's gone by different wording and different techniques in those 30 years and probably even longer. In recent five or 10 years, I would say it's flipped classrooms. How many people here use flipped classrooms to teach in the US? Quite a few. I've seen people use flipped classrooms brilliantly. I've seen people do flipped classrooms to be charitably, not brilliantly. On the other hand, I really like to lecture. And I would resist, and no one's trying to make me do a flipped classroom. Who here doesn't know what a flipped classroom is? OK, so it's clear that people are not from the US. Um, <laughs> the idea of the flipped classroom at its best is that you require the students before the class to do some preparation work. You see a short video, read some of the material, and in the class, there's cooperation with the groups together. And they're kind of learning the math in the room themselves. That they're kind of having those moments, if it works well, having those moments of insight in real time with the faculty member. The faculty member is lecturing, no, but the faculty member is walking around, making sure we've got the right hints. Make, so there's tremendous emphasis on people cooperating with each other. Tremendous emphasis on people trying to share their individual talents. All that is wonderful. Worst case, it's a bunch of people sitting there stuck, kind of going, the professor knows the answer and not telling me. But because I lecture, about four or five years ago, I had to actually consciously think of how I would describe it. Why I think lecturing good. But I think all of us agree with what we want to do with our students. We want our students to reach a stage where they have moments of insight. At least I know that's why I do math. That those even the small moments, go, ah. and occasionally those moments go, oh my God, that's beautiful. And we want to create a time when our individual students aren't just cranking away at stuff, but suddenly have a moment of enlightenment. And the flipped classroom, they're trying to do it in the class, and they go, no one listens to lectures. So here's how I came up with it I call it the four step method. One, I, two, you, singular, three, you, plural, four, we. Now, what do I mean by that? The I is me. That's the lecture. That's the beginning of everything, which I secretly believe. What I would do in a lecture is give an overview of the subject. I would try to identify why we're covering that class in that day, hopefully how it fits into the other rest of the semester, if not into mathematics. Trying to see that when the student leaves that room, they have some understanding of the chain rule, if that's the appropriate topic. Do I expect students, when they leave that room after a lecture, to be fluent and experts at the subject? Of course not. No one does that. Do I expect them to even be able to work a given problem? No. But I expect them to sort of get into the game, to see the big picture, to sort of see the outlines of the subject the beginnings of what's going on. 
Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. Can you repeat the question for the back? The back is, do I do this every lecture? And by every lecture, I don't say, functions describe the world, this is the steps. But I do do an overview. Oh, yeah, yeah, I almost always. So let, for example, let's make it concrete. Let's say you're teaching linear algebra. And your te linear algebra has different meanings at different places. But at Williams, linear algebra is overwhelmingly the first course where people start doing some proofs, and your goal is eventually get kind of abstract vector spaces. I would have every day on the sideboard the following. Theorem. Let A be an n by n matrix. The following are equivalent. One, A is invertible. Two, all the others. Uh, determinant of A is not equal to zero. <laughs> Three, the rows are literally independent. Four, the rows span the space. Five, the rows are da 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 we're going to go through and see why each one of these are individually important. And the real oomph of it is that they're all equivalent. That's the sort of thing I would do. Does that make sense? And so it's always so by the end of the semester, they know it all. Well, I'm hoping. That's the beginnings. Um, yeah. But that's the I. What do I mean about you singular? That when I tell the students, this is where the work really starts. You go back to your room or wherever you study, and you start trying to understand that lecture. I usually would recommend students to sit down with a blank sheet of paper and ask themselves, what did we do in class today? I tell them that probably they'll say something like, I don't remember. That's a good sign. That means you get out your notes, you look at them quickly, and you try to process and think of what was the punchline, what were the key tools we were supposed to learn. Just try. And it shouldn't take more than 15 minutes. And they should do that throughout the next couple of days. When they're standing and walking around campus, they go, OK, what was the point of that class? What was that point of that class? They should do that for every class. What was the point of that class? What was the point of that class? That's a little bit of the U singular. The U singular really is when they start trying to work the homework. Then when they try to go, oh, now I know how to compute the determinant. Oh, now I know what linear independence means. Or more likely, they can do the very routine problems. And they have some hint of how to work the harder problems. That's the U singular. Sort of the individual is sort of trying to start taking responsibility for what they know and what they don't know. That's the second. Any questions? Yeah? What if a student's not motivated enough to do that? Um, well, it depends on what state you're in, whether or not corporal punishment's allowed. <laughs> no, that is a problem. And I will, I will specify that very clearly, that this is very Williams-specific. And we'll I try to talk maybe later about how you do the student to get motivated. And that is a major problem, I agree. Uh, so the question was, well, what if the student doesn't do that? What if they're not motivated? Um, and I'm lucky enough that at a school like Williams, which has it's a kind of a fancy pants school, uh, all the students are deeply ambitious in the right way. They do their homework, and they come to class. And that already, much of the game is over. <laughs> Does that make sense? OK. Now it goes to you, plural. This is when a given student will meet with friends or people in their study group, either officially formed or not officially formed, and start talking about the problems with each other. This is the place they can ask someone, you know, I couldn't get problem 19. And the, person, and the person tells them how to do 19, great. Often, neither one knows how to do it, or none of the five people know how to do it, and they talk it out. 
I even tell them what's even better, though, is that if you think you know how to do problem 19, and someone asks you how to do problem 19, and you start explaining problem number 19, and you realize halfway through your explanation that you're full of something, that you have no clue of what's going on, that's really good. And I usually would bring in and say, that's the one reason why I try to collaborate when I do research. The number of times I think I have a brilliant idea, and I go to a professional colleague, and go, oh, no, I know how to do it. And they go, no, Tom, it's wrong here, wrong here, wrong here. Oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. It's not pleasant, but it really helps. Again, it's making it more of telling them that it's an interactive activity, that it's a creative activity, and that they should do it try to, together. Does that make sense? The we is probably getting closer to a flipped classroom. And that's that increasingly I find what's really important is office hours. The we is we all get together. Let's say in many of my courses beyond calculus, uh, it's usually structured, there's week-long uh, homework assignments. And so the rhythm is, is that that uh, office hour or hours, the day before it's all due, people have been working on it all week. And we all get together and try to solve it. Now, often, I don't, I mean, I sign the problems, I don't work them. Sometimes I do. So sometimes I'm working them in real time. Now, I've seen the material before, so I can do it usually faster than students. And there are certain topics that I would never do that for. Uh, I think this last spring I was teaching probability theory. So in the middle section, when we were doing central limit theorem, moment generating functions, fine, I could wing those problems. The first few problems are basic combinatorics. I wasn't going to wing, you know, you know, there, you know, there's. 18 people, six merry-go-rounds, everyone is wearing three different color hats and seven different colors of jerseys. What's the probability? Blah, blah, blah. I can't do that. I, you know, those I had to work out beforehand. The we is when we really come together. Is that making sense? Now, I suspect many of us are already doing this all the time, but not doing it consciously. I also realize it highly is dependent upon what type of institution you're teaching at. Williams is a fairly small school. It's residential. And as I said, the students do their homework. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I agree with that. I'll say that up front. Uh, it, now, what I'm saying is I don't have experience teaching at like a University of Kansas. I don't know what that's like. Um, the only places I've ever taught have been schools, uh, where have I taught? Brown, Rice, Williams. Uh, I think I taught a semester at the University of Michigan, but it was in their honors program. The people came to classes. Um, I would say that Making this explicit at the beginning, at the first lecture, when people probably do come, will help a lot. That's just my assumption. That when you set up the ground rules, and I do this at the beginning of class. Before I start the actual lectures, I write this on the board and explain each one of the steps. And I say all of the steps are important. And then later, when someone, let's say, does not do well on the first test, I can go back to this and go, did you do this? Did you do this? And almost always it's no, no, no. And it says, well, now it's clear what you do to do better. I'm not going to guarantee that's going to work. But if you make it up front, that will help. Make sense? Or you're kind of, I, I can't, I, the lights are very bright, but my guess is your facial expression is going, yeah, give me a break.
No, I, I mean, I, I know what you're saying. I disagree. Or no, I, I certainly grant that it could change. But I'm saying if you make this an emphasis, this is the way that people really learn. It's how we're learning here in the summer school here. Is that there's a moment, the actual craft of teaching and the interaction in the class, one-to-one, -one, looking the student in the eye, and they're seeing your eye. When they see you confused, when they see their peers confused, they don't see that online. If they do it online, they're just thinking of it as purely craft, which is where I'm going into next. And they have, now, it's perfectly reasonable for them to think that. But that's not what's really going on, and they will not have those moments of insight. So if we allow them to do that, I'm saying we're, we're denying them a certain joy. So that goes back to now to the lecture, to the I. In the actual lecture, what's going on? Increasingly in that, I emphasize the difference of story versus craft. Beginning students certainly don't know this at all, that there's a story behind the subject and there's technical tools you need to do to do the subject. We know that. In fact, well, in one of the morning lectures here, someone asked about some very hard theorem. says, what's the philosophy behind it? And the answer was eventually going, well, there is no philosophy. It's just a brutal calculation. And that's one reason why we don't know what to do next, because we don't have a good story yet. That happens in research. Doesn't happen that often in actual teaching, where we're teaching things that are well established. But to try to keep those story versus craft and let students know that there's a difference between the two is important. The craft, some of it, you can actually learn online. The story is much harder. You need to be able to look and see. In fact, one of the frustrations of this is the lights are very bright, and I have no idea of what people are looking like right now. Um, and the story is what makes the interaction important. I think, certainly in lower level math, this is what's emphasized all the time. And most students, especially beginning students, think that's what math is. It's the craft. It's the people who can solve the quadratic equation quickly. It's the person who knows how to do, who, who in fourth grade could do multiplication tables up to 12. And I understand why we emphasize craft. Mainly, it's much easier to test. I don't really know how to test story. I don't know how to walk in and go, explain to me the philosophical implications of the chain rule. There is one, right? The chain rule is phenomenal. You know, that functions describe the world. The world is complicated. We want as many functions as possible. If every real world situation had its own unique little function, that's a worthless statement. We somehow want to use functions that might be mildly easier to understand than the world. Then, well, what's the chain rule? Well, we know these very basic functions, polynomials, rational functions, sine, cosine, e to the x, log x. Well, wonder if we start composing them. Oh, gets complicated very fast. Rich collection of functions, huge collection of functions. If I compose six of them in the row and I can't do anything with it, I'm screwed. But the chain rule comes to our rescue. Ah! That's a great story. It's hard to test. It's easy to test. What's the derivative sine of x squared plus 3x plus the log x? So again, in the story, I would say there's the story of it the material in the given class, there's the material of how it's tied into the rest of mathematics. To make it more specific, here's the following situation. I was told I'm not going to be able to see here, but in terms of the video, but that doesn't really matter. Um, in the fall of 2021, I was going to teach second semester calculus. In the US, Second semester calculus is usually a course about integration. Now, at Williams, where everyone really loves to teach, lots of people like to teach various versions of calculus. I don't mind it. I like it. But I hadn't taught second semester calculus since the fall of 1994. 
not only long before any of my students were born, before a number of my colleagues were born. Um, and the time I taught it before, I didn't think it went that well. But this time, I thought about the story of calculus. And what I emphasized almost every day was the following. There's first of all, there's the whole notion of quantity. And I said, if you want to understand the world, there's three questions that are quite natural. This is like the first day, right after I said functions describe the world. One, how much? Two, how fast? Three, we're going. If you want to understand some physical phenomena, those are the questions you ask about. How much is there? How fast is it changing? Can you predict where it's going to go? I know that it's something about our early cave-dwelling ancestors going, how fast Master Dawn moving? Will it wipe out village? Probably something about, whoa, where's Master Dawn going in the long run? Or how much Master Dawn fur do I need for cave? Um, these are basic questions. And if you understand physical phenomena, those are the things you want the answer to. Of course, these are the three questions to a large sense that describes the world. But what else describes the world? Yeah, people louder. Just Functions. Functions. So to answer these three things, you're going to have to use functions. And that's where I lead. The purpose of second semester calculus is the how much question is an integral. A how fast is a derivative. And a where going is a differential equation. So we go from the stories that these three incredibly natural questions and we're starting to make it more precise, more technical. And then we start explaining, well, what is a derivative? Now, this is a second semester calculus course. They've all had, this was mostly first year students, so they had some sort of calculus in high school. And they overwhelmingly would think of um, the derivative as just technical tools. They knew how to compute because they had to do well on an AP test. But they didn't really think about it as how fast is it changing. And I said, we have a whole series of tools to compute how fast it's changing. We have all these craft tools for derivatives. <clears throat> then we would go through the integral of starting with some kind of thing. We want to know how much area there is, split it up into little thin rectangles, add them all up, do the Riemann sums, explain that that's living hell to actually compute, and then that miracle happens. And I really do think it's a miracle, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And the fundamental theorem of calculus says that the answers to these two questions are opposites of each other, inverses to each other. If I was God, I would have thought there'd be some sort of relationship between them, but I would not have set up the world so that they're actually precisely inverses to each other. That's too good to hope for. And I would explain the fundamental theorem of calculus is foundational to the modern world. I was thinking of the scientific method in Newton. Then once we have this worked out, we can start worrying about differential equations. That's a good story. Then the craft, how do you compute the derivative? And then how do you use the fundamental theorem of calculus to find integrals? Riemann sums, virtually impossible to compute beyond triangles. If you're really lucky, a circle. But with the fundamental theorem of calculus and you shift your mindset, oh, derivatives, that's pretty routine. That's mechanical. I can do it. That's a wonderful story. Any questions? Yeah. Just what you were mentioning before, that uh, yes, the fundamental theorem of calculus is, is, is amazing. But when they, yeah, but but when students actually come to calculate integrals, right, 
Are they going back and thinking about the derivative and then they're doing backwards? I kind of feel like they're no, not. They're not. And they're that's not. Close. They've that's, got more. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's an incredible point. Yeah, when they're actually, and when I'm doing the calculations, I'm not thinking that. You know? So that's the whole idea is that these are really different from each other. That understanding the story lets you get into the game and understand why it's important. Why it's important. The craft is important. I'm not saying don't pay attention to the craft. I think the craft is really important. And often, they're quite distinct. For example, when I, anyone here, if I gave you some kind of complicated derivative, you know, uh, let's say sine of cosine of sine of log of e to the x squared, and said take the derivative, Everyone here knows that's a rate of change. Everyone here knows it's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of x minus f of x, no, f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. And it's a limit of slopes of secant lines to get the tangent. Everyone knows that. No one would think about it in doing that derivative. In fact, it would get in your way. So that I emphasize that the craft is different than the story. In the same way, I know that when I drive a car, there's an internal combustion engine. I know there's little pistons going, and there's a little gas flowing through. If I'm thinking about that while driving, not good. So that goes back to emphasizing this and say, both of these are important. Both of these are essential. Does that answer your question? For now? <laughs> Now, this, these three things, the quantity shows up a lot in mathematics. But I originally had a fourth. And it was, what does it look like? Because that's another basic question that people would say. What does things look like? And it felt a little extra when it came to calculus. Not that we didn't do curve sketching. Not that there wasn't something about occasionally symmetry. So what I now would also have two columns. So I'd have a con quantities, basic things that you're asking about, and the other is symmetry or equivalence. And the questions here, and this is really good for this audience, is when are things the same? Two, what are different notions? of the same. And three, what are the parts and the glue when you take an object? If you want to understand when things are the same, you want to break it up into irreducible pieces and how you reassemble them. These are all kind of what does it look like. Now in calculus, these aren't that important of questions. Abstract algebra? Oh yeah. That's suddenly Equivalence problems at the heart of group theory. And I'll use that to explain this story the heavily. And those are kind of a framework that you can set things up for. Any questions? It's much cooler up here. Yeah. So what do you mean? I mean, uh, like oh. Right. I could. Uh, this is me just talking. Uh, I could imagine if you're teaching 14-year-olds and 15-year-olds, an hour lecture might be too long for them. I'm just guessing. Uh, yeah, I think it would be perfectly reasonable. Uh, it's, it's, 
most of the material I teach, it's, for me, it's uh, who's not very fast when it comes to math. It, I need time just to think by myself with other people not being around me. But I'm very much thinking this is at the college level or higher. Does that make sense? So can I piggyback on that? Do you, sure. Do you actually think that college students have an attention span to last an hour? Yeah. <laughs> I think the research suggests that that's not true. I think students have no trouble. I mean, you have to, you have to conscious. So the question is, he's saying college students have to pay attention an hour? That's absurd. Balderash. That's what I say. <laughs> um, no, no, no. But I do consciously, in the craft of teaching, I am not at the board kind of going, bleh, 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 theorem five, theorem six, theorem seven, theorem seven. I'm looking around a lot. I'm looking around, I'm going, is there any questions? I'm walking up to people. I sometimes would regularly, this is horrible for the people filming this. For, I'm now, I would regularly walk in the middle going, I'm now trying to invade your personal space. Pay attention. Yes, you're falling asleep. Yes, you're not paying attention. What do you have any questions about? I don't usually do that. You're doing fine. <laughs> you know, so that sort of thing I do all the time. In fact, I'm doing it deliberately now because I'm feeling that people aren't really paying attention right now. So I'm actually doing this in practice. I was up there thinking right before I was asked your question, I was thinking about, I'm losing people. People are not paying attention right now. God, that bothers me. And so sometimes if you're moving around the physical thing, you can have people pay attention. Is this sort of answering your question? It's almost providing like a commercial break. I would sometimes make stupid jokes and tell them this is a stupid pedagogical trick just to wake you up so you can pay attention. I would sometimes make the joke, if you need me, if we have permission, I will slap you to stay awake. I would never actually do that because that's both wrong morally and probably illegal. I sit back to the battery. So in some sense, I'm recognizing that it's hard for a human being to pay attention for an entire lecture. I have a hard time paying attention more than 10 minutes. I'm sitting there after 10 minutes trying to find the remote, going, change the channel, change the channel, change the channel. And I recognize that as a reality. But I also recognize that if you change the channel ever so briefly and say, does anyone have any kind of question? Or if you artificially raise your voice. If you artificially just kind of, this is more the craft of teaching. It's not the theory of teaching. It's just how you would interact with people. You get softer and softer. People start paying attention. You even make the joke. I hope everyone falls asleep. Then I don't have to work anymore. But maybe that's not good. Maybe everyone is real quiet. Everyone is just in rapt awe. But I see one person back row who stayed up too long studying for that chemistry final doesn't pay attention to math at all so we have to talk it real loud that's an effective way of breaking up the classroom and trying to get people to pay attention for the entire hour does that make sense of trying to answer so i'm aware of that and if you drag it that way i think it kind of works any questions sure where something that's like a very traditional thought you you are throwing knowledge at their heads for an hour and then expect them to have free time when they're not you know going and working three jobs just to be able right. to feed their parents when they're not you know, how do you deal with the fact i mean i guess there's a number of questions there's demographics are very limited in your experience but for those of us who teach right. places with very diverse students how how do you so there's the one question of the people who have like normal lives and aren't just students, who have real responsibilities. And I'm lucky that most of my students are there as to be students. And I I've certainly can't, can't imagine telling someone, you should have done your homework. My kid was sick. And I go, well, of course take care of your kid. That's the obvious right thing to do. Uh, the little bit about this is that schools like Williams are very committed to being people from very different backgrounds. So one reason, but not since they're going to have full-time jobs, but in the sense of, you know, we have students who are coming from the really fancy prep schools. You know, I make fun of them all the time, hopefully with love. You know, going, oh, how's your polo pony? Uh, but there's also students who are, it's moving up a level of education they're just not used to. That I am, con I try to be consciously aware of. One reason why I'm explicit with those four steps 
talking about story versus craft is I'm trying to explain to them how do you study. I'm trying and I regularly talk about what's the right method by which you start trying to understand the material. That sort of helps explain it. And I do it over and over and over again. It does not get around the whole. It puts more of an onus on students that don't come from frivolous backgrounds. They have to put in so much more time and effort than everyone else. They're probably, it's certainly going to be the case that someone who's gone to a high school at a very privileged place is going to be more aware of how to study than the student who doesn't. And I don't know how to get around that particularly easily. But I do think that in that given semester, you could help a lot in having them develop and get ready for the rest of their lives. And that does seem to work. So I've noticed a lot of students, so there is clearly in the time I've been teaching at Williams, which is since 1989, uh, this, the demographics of the student body has changed overall for the good. It is the case that people who are coming from more traditional disadvantaged backgrounds ha are, in our words, are a bit higher maintenance. They have more, they're just not ready, quite ready for it. But I've noticed is that they catch up pretty quickly. I wouldn't use the word the right way. I would just say it's a right way. That somehow there's a lot of interaction with others and by themselves to think about the material a lot and they will have moments of insight. Yeah, I do think that. Very strongly. Uh, and I've seen this, I assume all of us who are uh, at schools see this fairly often. Uh, st students who are clueless, who seem to not know anything, and then suddenly something clicks. It happened to me. I remember when I, I went to an okay high school, not great. And I was, whoa, I did not know what was going on. And it was very frustrating. And there was one night when it clicked. And now a lot of that clicking I don't see, because it happens in, you know, how would I know? I'm not in their dorm rooms. Uh, sometimes students tell me this. They were totally clueless. They didn't even know what math was. And suddenly, during that problem set, it made sense. Now, it is the case regularly. Williams is very lucky. It has an incredible number of math majors. Uh, the classes of 500, there's usually about 80 to 100 math majors. And it is not the case they come to a small school in Massachusetts to major in math. So what regularly happens is that, and this is for all students, is they show up, they go, I never knew what math was. They were thinking of math as solely craft. And they were okay at it, but not great. And something clicks in there. And that's why I firmly believe it. Other questions? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you. So I think you mentioned uh, that it's difficult to test if if they understand the story part. It's right. much easier to test the craft. And I think, I mean, I've, you know, the story I've heard is, you know, the student goes on and, goes and carries on with their engineering degree, and then later they're in some project, and then they need to know uh, what they're actually doing. They need to know that, you know. Right. But, but yeah, I mean, how, how do you know that the story is getting across to the, the students, or, or is there a way to, 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 to test it? I wish I knew. Um, the, only, the only evidence I would have is anecdotal, is that people in later semesters, things fall to place, and it's always heartwarming to hear from former students saying, you know, I was one of your weaker students, but I can remember one saying, I use functions every day. <laughs> functions really do describe the world. The motivation is what's key in the given lecture at the beginning. It's the motivation is the I part. The motivation is when you're trying to convince them why it's important, why they should care. So it's the motivation is why the lecture is important. You could say, well, just erase the stupid eye, give them a bunch of problems, make them work together, and then show up casually at the end for office hours and say that's wrong. 
Of course, that's not what I'm saying. The I is the motivating. It's the I, and there's different ways of motivating. You can do it through uh, enthusiasm. You can do it like I do, almost like a clown with big shoes and a floppy tail. You can also do it with quiet intensity. So in this, in this kind of framework, which is not mathematics, but it is trying to motivate people. And it is trying to say that they can see how different parts of math fit in. And this leads to the last topic that I was writing about in the title, Math Maturity. This is also tied in to motivation, and it's tied in to the difference between story and craft. When you're talking about story and craft, you have to be very aware of what level of mathematical maturity are your students at. It's very easy for us to try to teach students that we want to teach, not the students we have, which I think is going back to your question. That, but thinking about mathematical maturity as not an either or thing, but a lifelong process. That's much of what I talked about in 2017, explaining it. That mathematical maturity, usually for mathematicians, means can you do a proof or not? And it's usually difficult for people to figure out what is a proof. And we've all seen students who don't even know how to articulate what's going on. They don't have the concept of proof yet to the kind of errors that we all make in proofs. It's just like honest errors. We just get something wrong. You know, we just say, well, all cows have wings, and then we start concluding things, and that we, our reasoning is perfectly fine if all cows had wings. And that's just not true. We're making honest mistakes. All groups are bum, and that's just not true. Um, but mathematical maturity is you have to pay attention to what level are your students at? One of the real problems in teaching math for all of us is that compared to the general population, we're all pretty good at it. Now, I suspect if you're all like me, you're going to conferences like this, and you're thinking, God, I'm dumb. But compared to most of the world, we're good, and we're also, there is the selective bias, is that we all succeeded in the system. So we all do, and, and there's a, so this sense that we're not aware of what our students don't know. And there has to be an awareness of where the student is at. So if I'm teaching a beginning calculus course, I'm kind of aware that they don't speak high school algebra fluently yet. And I have to be aware you have to introduce it in a right kind of way. You have to be aware that in other classes they know this material, but not this material. And so the math maturity fits in that these are questions that anyone can understand. Almost everyone will look, especially this first column, and that how you answer it depends upon the level of mathematical maturity that you're at. If you're a little bit further along, if you're doing motivic homotopy theory, if you're trying to explain to relatives what you're doing here and what the topic is, these questions suddenly become quite relevant. I certainly found myself before I came here, they said, oh, I'm going to go to Utah for three weeks. What's the topic? Motivic homotopy theory. And people would look at me blankly, and then I would immediately say, I know, everyone wants to come, right? Whoa! And I said, I'm not an expert. Don't really know what it is. I'm guessing it means the following. Homotopy theory is a fancy word for one or two things the same when you wiggle them. Motives is a word from the 60s by a guy named Grothendieck, and it's a dream. It was originally a dream for cohomology, which you don't know what that means, but it's a dream of a universal theory that will account everything. These are putting the wiggling in context where there's no obvious wiggling. Did I get that all right? Now I'm asking, if there's experts in the audience, is that at a vague level correct? No? <laughs> Was it just dead wrong? After two weeks. <laughs> but already.
already, you know, I'm sitting there kind of going, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When are things the same? What is the notion of same you're after? Oh, it's wiggling. If you're in the undergraduate group, you're doing pi one. You know, take loops. When can you wiggle one loop to another? That seems a very natural thing to do. Oh, does this work in context you don't know about? But that's a very different level of mathematical maturity. So if our teaching beginning group theory, where part of the goal of that course is to learn how to do proofs, part of the goal of that course is to learn how to deal with abstract systems, part of that goal of that course is to understand how do you take axioms and include things, the story is, is that groups are the way you measure equivalence properties and when are things the same. And I will talk vaguely about that way. I will bring in things like Noether's theorems and calculus of variations, explain how the basic laws of physics like conservation of energy, or conservation of momentum, or conservation of angular momentum, are all coming from group theory properties. I'll try, I will even say the words briefly, oh, how do you describe what a photon is? It's a certain a group theory uh, concept. If I was teaching a course in representation theory, which I certainly have, so these are people who already know group theory, they're at a level of mathematical maturity, they know how to do proofs, but they're really kind of could easily get trapped in all the calculations with representations, I will occasionally say, oh, here how it fits into the equivalence in the following senses. Here's how it explains what a photon is. Here's how it explains what an electron is. And other contexts. So and this is the final part was the mathematical maturity. You have to be very aware of the level of mathematical maturity and make the story and the craft age appropriate. In the same way with mathematical maturity, you have to make the notion of function you're talking about age appropriate. So, overwhelmingly, ironically, teaching is a craft. I'm consciously aware that students are coming from different backgrounds and aren't necessarily aware of how I think they should learn, or this is one method of learning. And thus, I will emphasize the I, you, singular, you, plural, we. I will repeat it regularly. I'll particularly emphasize office hours. I will regularly emphasize story versus craft. I will regularly emphasize these questions and talk about how does our topic fit into this framework, trying to create an overall structure. The hope is that they begin to realize that mathematics is not just useful, which almost everyone thinks it is, but most people think it's useful for other people. But that mathematics is not just useful at some kind of crude, pragmatic level, but that mathematics really is the ultimate structure of reality. That's a thing of beauty. That's a thing of creativity. That's a thing that's worthwhile to, to struggle with, while at the same time recognizing math is really hard. And through all these things, I regularly talk about how hard it is and that it's worth it. And of course, we conclude by the simple fact that functions describe the world. Thanks.